this evening, rather. I'm, I'm getting the, the time of my day wrong. Uh, but it's good to see you here tonight. I, as always, I appreciate this opportunity to be back with you. I'm sure many of you remember me as, as the little kid that sat up here in the front and was dragged to the back to get spankings every once in a while. Uh, but it's a, blessing, it's a blessing to be back with you, and it's a blessing to have this opportunity to study God's Word together. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. As was pointed out, we're going to be studying in Acts chapter 2 tonight. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to be beginning there in verse 14. Acts chapter 2, and beginning there in verse 14. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. I want you to understand that tonight, we are going to be studying one of the most important topics that you find throughout the pages of the Bible. That tonight we're going to be looking at one of the most important topics. We're going to be studying one of the most important topics that you find throughout the pages of this book. That you find throughout the pages of Scripture. This summer, in your summer series, you're studying the Bible by numbers. And I think that that's such an awesome topic. I think that that's such an interesting topic. As stated just a few moments ago, tonight, as we study Acts chapter 2 and as we look at Acts chapter 2, we're going to be thinking about 3,000 souls that were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to be thinking about 3,000 souls that were added to the church of our Lord. We're going to be thinking about 3,000 souls that received the, the salvation that God graciously gives. The title that was assigned to me tonight is The Gospel Message of Salvation. Now, I want you to think about that title with me for just a few moments. The Gospel Message of Salvation. You notice that first word, gospel. I think the English word gospel kind of veils the meaning of that word. You see, our English word gospel kind of hides its true meaning. When you look in the original Greek, the word gospel is translated from the noun euangelion or from the verb euangelizo. And what the word gospel simply means is in its noun form, good news, or in its verb form, to proclaim good news or to share good news. And so before we dive into Acts chapter 2, I want you to realize here what we're talking about. When we talk about the gospel message of salvation, we're talking about literally the good news message of salvation. That when we talk about the gospel message of salvation here tonight, we are proclaiming the good news that salvation has been made available through Jesus Christ to every man and every woman who has reached the age of accountability. We're proclaiming the good news. We're sharing the good news that mankind can be saved from his sin. That mankind can be saved from the consequences of sin. That mankind can be saved from spiritual death and having to spend an eternity separated from God. The gospel message of salvation. As we think about Acts chapter 2 and as we study Acts chapter 2, as we think about these 3,000 souls that are saved and we think about the gospel message of salvation, I think that there's an idea that we need to understand. I think that there's something that we need to realize before we dive into Acts chapter 2. And I think it's something that not only we need to understand, not only we need to realize, but this is something that the religious world needs to understand. This is something that the denominational world needs to realize. And that is the fact that there is just one gospel. There's just one gospel. Wouldn't it be helpful in a world of religious division, in a world where hundreds and hundreds of different churches exist, that we realize there is just one gospel? You think about Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. There is one body and one spirit. You were called in one hope of your calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. There is just one gospel. And when you look in the New Testament, that gospel is often described as the gospel of God in Romans chapter 15 and verse 16. It's described as the gospel of Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. It's described as the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of the church in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. I want you to realize it's not my goal tonight 
It's not my intent tonight to stand before you and to proclaim to you what some might label as a church of Christ gospel. I don't want to preach what some might call a church of Christ gospel tonight, just like I don't want to preach a Baptist gospel tonight. I don't want to preach a Methodist gospel tonight. I don't want to preach a Catholic gospel tonight. Just fill in the blank. As we study together tonight, as we think about Acts chapter 2, I want us to think about the one gospel, the unchanging gospel, the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. I think Paul says some very good words in Galatians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. When he says, if anyone preaches to you any other gospel than that which you have received, what? Let him be accursed. As Christians, we should be set apart for the gospel. Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, as Paul was, truly, woe is unto me if I do not preach the one gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we think about Acts chapter 2 tonight, we think about these 3,000 souls that, are, that were saved on the day of Pentecost. We think about the gospel message of salvation, realizing that there is just one gospel, the true unchanging gospel. I want us to notice two main points as we study Acts chapter 2 tonight. Two main points. The first one's going to come from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 36. Verses 14 through 36, I want us to notice the message of salvation. I want us to notice the gospel message of salvation. What is the message of salvation? Well, I believe that Peter shed some light on that when we look in verses 14 through 36. And then number two, I want us to notice in Acts 2, verses 37 and 38, the requirements of salvation. You see, the simple truth is this. Just listening to the message of salvation is not enough to save your soul. Just hearing the gospel message of salvation, as glorious and as great as that is, it's not enough to provide your soul with the salvation that it needs. The truth is, the gospel requires us to do something. And so what are those requirements? Well, we'll talk about that in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Now, before we get into Acts chapter 2, I want to take just a few moments to establish the context of what we're looking at here in Acts chapter 2. And I think that you can do that by going all the way back to Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, Jesus is speaking to His disciples and He says, There are some of you who are standing here who will not taste death, notice it, until you see the kingdom of God coming with power. Zone in on that last phrase there in verse 1. You will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God coming with power. That is in direct accordance with things that are promised in the Old Testament, such as Isaiah chapter 2, where the Isaiah tells us that the house of the Lord will be established in the mountains, that it will be established in the city of Jerusalem, and that all nations will flow to it. That promise in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1 is in direct accordance with what we see in Daniel chapter 2, that the Lord God will establish a kingdom that will reign forever, that will never come to an end. And so we realize the kingdom of God will come with power. The church will come with power in Mark chapter 9. You fast forward to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, again, Jesus is speaking to His disciples. This is a little bit later. After His death, after His burial, after His resurrection, He's about to ascend back into heaven. And you notice what He says in verse 8. He says to His disciples, You will receive what? Power. The kingdom of God will come with power, Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you will receive power. When? Well, notice verse 8. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the world. What we see promised to the disciples there in verse 8 can also be seen in verse 5 of Acts chapter 1. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so you fast forward to Acts chapter 2. And you look there in verse 1. You notice that the Bible says it was the day of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost was a Jewish feast. It was celebrated annually annually. 
It celebrated the beginning of the harvest. And what they would do, it, it was celebrated 50 days after the Passover feast. And so that means that every single year, the day of Pentecost was celebrated on the first day of the week. And so it's the day of Pentecost here in verse 1, and you notice verse 2, Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves. They rested on each one of them. And notice verse 4, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Let me ask you, what's happening in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4? As you look at that, what's taking place? Well, as I look at Acts 2, verses 2 through 4, what I see are promises being fulfilled. I see Isaiah chapter 2 beginning to be fulfilled. I see Daniel 2 beginning to be fulfilled. I see Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, the kingdom of God coming with power, the church coming with power. I see that beginning to be fulfilled here in Acts chapter 2. I see the promise of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 fulfilled. That the disciples would receive power when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, when they were immersed or baptized with the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so verse 5, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. You go to Acts chapter 2, verses 9-11, through 11, we find that these Jews who would have came to the city of Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost to celebrate the day of Pentecost, we find in verses 9-11, through 11, they were from at least 15 different places. And those 15 different places that we see are countries from all over the known world at that time. And so you have... What, exactly what you see in verse 5 here in Acts chapter 2. Devout Jews coming to the city of Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost from every nation under heaven. Fifteen different places. And so verse 6, when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. The disciples are filled with the Spirit. They're speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They go into the city of Jerusalem. They're speaking in tongues. People see that. What happens? A crowd gathers. And so here the disciples, the apostles, captivate an audience, we find, of thousands and thousands of Jews who are listening to them speak in tongues. Well, what did it mean for the disciples to speak in tongues? Well, notice verse 6. The crowd came together and they were bewildered. Why? Because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. That's what it meant for the disciples to speak in tongues. They were hearing what the disciples were saying in their own language. They were from different places. They spoke different languages. But here they hear the apostles speaking, each one of them, in their own language. A miracle. And so you continue on in verse 7, they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear them in our own language to which we were born? You skip down to verses 12 and 13, we see further details about how they respond to what's happening in Acts chapter 2. And I believe that you can really describe that with three words. The crowd here, the Jews who were gathered and listening to the apostles, they were confused, they were amazed, and some of them took the opportunity to make fun. They were confused, they were amazed, and some of them were mocking. Notice verse 12. And they all continued in amazement, great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. And so this sets the stage for us, doesn't it? This sets the scene for us. For us, As we look here in Acts chapter 2, it's the day of Pentecost in fulfillment of so many different promises. The disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in tongues. They gather this large audience of Jews from everywhere, from every nation under heaven, about 15 different countries, 15 different places. And so you notice Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 14. In verses 14 through 36, as we take a few moments to wade through this and to read through this, to wrestle with this, I want us to notice here in verses 14 through 36 the message of salvation. The gospel message of salvation that comes from the lips of Peter here in Acts chapter 2. When you look at Peter's sermon here, I believe you can divide it up into three sections. And so that's what we're going to be doing tonight in verses 14 through 21. As Peter speaks to these thousands and thousands of Jews who have gathered in the city of Jerusalem, 
In verses 14 through 21, he wants them to understand what's going on. He wants them to understand what's happening. He wants them to understand what's happening before their eyes, what they're seeing, and what they're hearing. Notice verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, he raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. If you think back to Matthew chapter 16, we're familiar with verse 18 when Jesus says, On this rock I will build my church. But then you look at the next verse, verse 19, and Jesus tells Peter what? I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Here, Peter uses those keys of the kingdom to open up the kingdom, to open up the church for the very first time to those who are here present on the day of Pentecost. Notice verse, here verse 15. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. In other words, it's nine o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. Verse 16. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Peter wants his audience to understand what's going on. He wants them to understand what's happening. He says, we're not drunk like some of you are saying. He says, what's happening right now, the things you're seeing, the things you're hearing, they are in fulfillment of what Joel prophesied about. And you notice that Peter, in verses 17 through 21, quotes from the Old Testament. Do you know why he did that? He knew his audience. He's speaking to Jews. The Jews knew the Old Testament. The Old Testament was their authority. They studied the Old Testament. They respected the Old Testament. And so what Peter does is, number one, he shows, here's the truth of what I'm saying. You can see it in the Old Testament. And number two, by quoting from the Old Testament, he gets their attention. He gets them to listen. And so he says, understand what's happening. What's happening right here is in fulfillment of what Joel says. It's a quote from chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Verse 17, It shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my Spirit on all mankind. On your sons and your daughters they shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my Spirit. They shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day the Lord shall come, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here Peter gets their attention. He says, I want you to understand what's happening. This is what's taking place. Do you remember what you read in Joel? That's what you're seeing, and that's what you're hearing. And so as he's gotten their attention with verses 14 through 21, in verses 22 through 28, what Peter does is he gets to the central subject of his message. As he's proclaiming the message of salvation, the gospel message of salvation, he gets to the main subject in verses 22 through 28. Let me ask you, what is the central subject of the message of salvation? It's Jesus Christ. And you see that in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through Him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put Him to death. Here, Peter, he not only wants to emphasize Jesus' life and his ministry and the miracles and signs and wonders that were performed through him, he not only wants to emphasize that Jesus died and he was crucified and he was put to death, Peter wants to emphasize that the Jews were witnesses to these things. That they saw these things happen. He says in verse 22, you remember Jesus, don't you? Don't you remember the miracles and the signs and the wonders that were done through Him almost everywhere He went? He says, you were witnesses of this. But then in verse 23, Peter gets a little bit more pointed, doesn't he? And he says, realize you didn't only witness the death of Jesus, but as Jews, you were the ones responsible for the death of Jesus. That you were the ones who took Jesus by lawless hands. You were the ones who crucified Him. Yes, it was in accordance with God's plan, wasn't it? That's what Peter says. But the Jews were the ones who freely chose to crucify Jesus Christ. 
And so here Peter is placing responsibility on them. He's placing weight on them. And so you notice what happens in verse 24 as Peter continues. He wants the Jews to understand that's not the end of Jesus' story. Yes, He died. Yes, He was buried. But that wasn't the end. Verse 24, But God raised Him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for Him to be held in its power. Now in verses 25-28, through 28, Peter goes back to the Old Testament. He quotes from Psalms chapter 16, verses 8-11, through 11, and he does that to demonstrate that the resurrection of Jesus, it was in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Beginning there in verse 25, For David says of him, I saw the Lord in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. Now zone in on verse 27. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades. You're not going to leave my soul in Hades or the realm of the dead. It's not going to remain there. Nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay or to see corruption. He says you're not going to allow the body of your Holy One to undergo decay. You're not going to allow that body to be corrupted. Why? Because it's going to be resurrected. Verse 28, You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And so now the Jews understand what's going on. Verses 14-21, through 21, they understand the central message of what Peter is preaching here. Jesus Christ in verses 22-28. through 28. Now in verses 29-36, through 36, Peter has to clarify some things. He has to make sure that the Jews understand a couple of things. More specifically, what Peter wants his audience to understand is that in Psalms chapter 16, David was not referring to himself. That David was not talking about himself in Psalm chapter 16. That when you look there in verse 27, you'll not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Peter wants to impress upon his audience, David wasn't talking about himself. David, his soul, he was not referring to himself when he said, you're not going to leave my soul in Hades. You're not going to allow my body to undergo decay. He was talking about somebody else. Who was it? Jesus Christ. You notice verse 29. Why couldn't it have been David? Why couldn't have David been referring to himself? Why wasn't David the one who was resurrected? Well, notice verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, what? That he both died, he was buried, his tomb is with us to this day. It couldn't have been David. You can go and see his remains. You can go to his tomb Today, right now, he says. And so verse 30, And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, Psalms 132 and verse 11, he looked ahead and he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, verse 32, God has raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Verse 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Verse 34, For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, from Psalms 110 and verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, or God said to the Lord Jesus, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Peter says you have to realize David wasn't the one who was resurrected. David wasn't referring to himself in Psalm 16. He was referring to Jesus. Jesus was the one who was resurrected. He says you have to understand David was not the one who ascended into heaven and God said to him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He says that David is referring to Jesus there in Psalms 110 and verse 1. Da Jesus is the one who is exalted at the right hand of God. And so here's his conclusion, verse 36. Don't you love this? Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain. Let them know without a doubt that God has made Him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So you think about Acts 2, verses 14 through 36, and here you see the message of salvation, the gospel message of salvation. You know, you could take those 23 verses and boil it down to two words. We've already mentioned it. What are those two words? 
Take the message of salvation in Acts 2, boil it down. What Peter is talking about, he's talking about Jesus Christ. He, the gospel message of salvation, understand, is all about Jesus Christ. It's about His life. It's about His ministry. It's about the miracles and signs and wonders that were done through Him in verse 22. It's about His death his crucifixion, the blood that He shed in verse 23 and verse 36. It's about His resurrection. That yes, He died and He was buried, but He's been raised again in verse 24 and in verse 32. The gospel message of salvation, it's about the exaltation of Jesus. That He is the one who is reigning at God's right hand. And in the context of Acts 2, He poured out what they were seeing and what they were hearing. When you look at verse 36... This is the gospel message of salvation in its most simplest form. That this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. That is the gospel message of salvation. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Christ. And I want you to realize the same gospel message of salvation that Paul preached in Acts 2 is the same message of salvation that we preach today, isn't it? The one gospel, the unchanging gospel, has an unchanging message. And that message is Jesus Christ. Don't we still preach the life of Jesus? His ministry? The things that He did? John 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. But verse 14, the Word became flesh and He dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. 1 John 2 and verse 6 says if we're going to follow after Jesus, then we need to be willing to walk just as He walked or to live just as He lived. He is the exact representation of the Father when we look at His life. Hebrews chapter 1. Don't we still preach about the death of Jesus, His crucifixion, the blood that was shed for you and for me at Calvary? It's through His blood, Ephesians 1 and verse 7, that we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. He has purchased us by His blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. The blood of Christ was the price that was paid for your salvation and for my salvation. Don't we still preach the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? That on the third day He was raised, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, we have a living hope hope through that resurrection. We have a hope that is living, not a hope that is dead, that one day we too will be resurrected in the same way when He returns. Don't we still preach the exaltation of Jesus? That He is the one who is sitting and reigning at God's right hand, interceding for us? Romans chapter 8 and verse 4. Don't we still preach that He is our advocate before the Father? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. That He is the one pleading our case before God each and every day. Don't we still preach the simple message that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Christ? And so I want you to realize here, when we look at Acts chapter 2, and we look at this message of salvation that is preached by the Apostle Peter, the unchanging gospel has an unchanging message. The same gospel preached in Acts 2 is the same gospel that we preach today. The same message that saved in Acts 2 is the same message that saves today. And that is Jesus Christ. So you see the message of salvation, verses 14 through 36. Now number two, I want us to notice here for the next few minutes or so, the requirements of salvation. The question is, what does the gospel require of me? Because as we said just a moment ago, just listening to this message of salvation, it's not enough to save you. It's not enough to supply you with the salvation that your soul needs. I could stand up here all night and say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Christ, until my face is blue. And if you don't respond to that, it's not going to do anything for you. And so what does the gospel require of me? And what does the gospel require of you? Well, notice with me Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. When they heard this, what happened? They were pierced to the heart. Or they were cut to the heart. They have just heard this message that's all about Jesus. And more specifically, a message that was about how they were the ones responsible for putting Him to death. That God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Can you imagine hearing the message that you were the one who nailed Jesus to the cross? Can I tell you that's a message that we preach today? And so when they hear this message, what is their response? The Bible says that they were pierced to the heart. What does that mean? 
What does it mean that they were cut to the heart or pierced to the heart? Well, if you want to look at at it in an illustration type of way, you could look at it like this. The message was a needle, and that needle penetrated all the way through their heart. That they were convicted. They were convicted of their sin. They were convicted that they were the ones who put Jesus to death. They were convicted of the fact that they had killed the one whom God had made both Lord and Christ. They realize they're guilty. They're sorrowful and remorseful for what they've done. They realize they're not in the right relationship with God. They realize, I'm not where I need to be spiritually. And so what do they do in verse 37? Well, they're pierced to the heart and they say to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? They're convicted by this message of salvation. It pierces them to the heart. And you notice their question. What do we need to do, Peter? What do we need to do to make this right? What do we need to do to be in the right relationship with God? Peter, you just preached this message to us about Jesus and about the salvation that comes through Jesus. Now you have to tell me what I have to do. You preached this message. Now you have to tell me how to respond to it, Peter. What are the requirements? And you notice what Peter says there in verse 38. I believe he's very clear. Notice, as they ask, what do we need to do? Peter tells them exactly what to do. Peter said to them, okay, just bow your heads. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner and I want to receive You into my heart. So right now, become the Lord of my life. Thank You for saving me. Amen. Is that what Peter tells them to do? Notice what Peter says in verse 38. Peter said to them what? Here's the requirements. Repent. What does it mean to repent? Whenever you repent, what that means is that you're sorrowful over the sins that you've committed. And you allow that sorrow to lead you to change. It's a 180 degree turn. That no longer am I going to walk in darkness, I'm going to walk in the light as He's in the light. 1 John 1 and verse 7. That no longer am I going to wander in the wilderness of sin, I'm going to lay my life down a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, acceptable to the Lord. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Some people look at repentance as just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is more than that. Repentance says, I'm sorry, but then allows that feeling to lead me to make the changes that I need to make to come into the right relationship with the Father. And so Peter says you have to repent, and then notice this, let each of you... Is there any exclusion there? Let every one of you, no exclusions, be baptized or literally be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. What's the purpose? For the forgiveness of your sins. And then the result, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit will dwell within you. But notice this, baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. You can't change that and I can't change that. Baptism is not an outward sign of inward faith. You are not saved. Your sins are not forgiven prior to baptism. Baptism is for or unto. The Greek conjunction there, ice. It's for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so as they ask this question in verse 37, Peter is glad to answer it. What do we need to do? Peter says, this is what you do. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. The unchanging gospel has unchanging requirements. And there they are in verse 38. The gospel. The gospel message of salvation. You can't change it. I can't change it. The gospel is unchanging. The unchanging gospel has an unchanging message. That message is Jesus Christ. What Jesus was willing to do for us. What Jesus is still doing for us. The gospel message of salvation has requirements. It has stuff that we have to do in order to come into a relationship with God and receive the salvation that He gives. Peter says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of of your sins. Let me ask you this question. What's the result of all of this? You hear the message of salvation. You obey the requirements of salvation. What's the result? What happens? Well, this is where we get to verse 41 and what we're talking about tonight. So then those who received His Word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. You hear the message of salvation. You respond to it by obeying the requirements of salvation, 
And the result is that you receive God's salvation. If you have any questions about anything that I've said, then I hope that you'll reach out to somebody. I hope that you'll ask somebody. But I ask someone here in this congregation, talk to me. We weren't able to study every aspect, every angle of this. There's just not enough time. And so if you have any questions over anything we've covered, then please do not hesitate to ask. I also want to say this. Please realize, don't make any apologies for what we've presented tonight. Don't apologize about the message of salvation. Don't apologize about the requirements of salvation. Boldly stand up for them. Romans 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus because it's the power of God to salvation for all who believe. Peter says first to the Jew, or Paul says rather, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. The unchanging gospel has an unchanging message. It has unchanging requirements. And when you hear that message and you obey those requirements, your soul can be added to the church of our Lord. You can receive God's salvation just like the 3,000 in Acts chapter 2. I believe that's about close to my time. I appreciate your kind attention. Again, I appreciate this opportunity to be with you. I hope that this study has blessed you. This study has blessed me. And I hope that you can use it to bless others. Thank you guys very much. That is asked by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. And I think that this is a question at some time in your life you have to ask. And this is a question at some point in your life you have to answer. When you look in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, and you look near the last half of that verse, Peter asks the question, he says, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? You think about that question. We've talked about the gospel tonight. The unchanging gospel. It's unchanging message. It's unchanging requirements. What will be the outcome of your life? What will be the outcome of your soul if you never obey the gospel of our Lord? Well, I want you to notice what Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. This is what he says. He says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to give to us as well. When? Well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His holy angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and notice it, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. What will be the outcome if you never obey the gospel of our Lord? I believe Paul answers that at least in part for us. He says, if you, to those who do not obey the gospel, when Jesus returns, He will deal out retribution to them. Or in other words, He's going to give them what they deserve. Let me ask you, what is it that Jesus is going to give to those who do not obey the gospel that they deserve? What is it? We notice verse 9. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. This is not what I want for you. This is not what anyone wants for you. This is not what God desires for you. He desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. But if you never obey the gospel of our Lord, then you will spend an eternity, Paul says, in destruction. You will spend an eternity away from the presence of God. And so the question is, have you obeyed the gospel tonight? You think about the one gospel, its unchanging message, Jesus Christ, its unchanging requirements, how you obey the gospel. You have to hear the Word. You have to believe that Word and then be willing to confess the name of Jesus. I believe when we look at Acts chapter 2, those Christians were already willing to do that. They believed in Jesus. That's evident by the question that they asked, what do we need to do? They were willing to confess Him. That's evident by them being convicted and them being pierced to the heart. And so what Peter tells them in Acts 2 is he says you have to complete the process. You have to hear, believe, confess, repent of your sins, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you never follow those steps, 
What will be the outcome of your soul? And Paul says it will be an everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord. So if you haven't obeyed the Gospel tonight, if you're not a Christian, then our prayer is that you'll consider making that decision, that you'll further study into making that decision, or if you're ready to make that decision tonight, we hope that you will. Maybe you are a Christian. I want you to realize that obeying the Gospel, hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, that's not your golden ticket into heaven. Be faithful unto death, Jesus says, and I will give you a crown of life. What if you're not faithful to death? In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. And so if you're here and you're a Christian, you have obeyed the Gospel, you're not living the kind of life that you need to live, then let's make that right tonight. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to go to God on your behalf. What will be the outcome of your soul if you never obey the Gospel? Well, a quotation from what we studied tonight, Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, this is our plea. Save yourself from this crooked generation as we stand and as we sing.